Great. Well, welcome everyone and um, happy Thanksgiving. I can't believe it's the, the end of the year already. So very excited to, um, to have you join us and um, uh, for our community meeting. And Jeff is going to be managing the slide. So if you can go to the next slide. All right, so here's the agenda. I'm gonna do a couple of like three minute general updates um, just because we have a packed agenda. Um, and then we've got two uh, major presentations about computer phenotypes from Griffin and also loyalty cohorts from, from Jeff. I think Jeff goes first and Griffin goes second. So why don't we go to the next slide? Um, I just, I wanted to, to thank everyone um, for who attended our um, ITB2 symposium in September. Um, I think it was it was uh, a, a very very well attended and and uh, people a lot of great feedback. Um, Jeff, you can go to the next slide. So this year we actually had like a forty percent increase in registrations from the prior year, and I I'm not exactly sure why. I think people are um, starting to come to conferences a little bit more, but also I think the the content and the focus around AI um, was a real draw. We got um, we did have 37% of the folks um, attend virtually, um, which was which a little bit hard to manage, but I think it was good. We had a larger turnout in the Harvard Boston community area because um, we did advertise a bit more. So we got some newcomers that um, were interested in, in ITB2, interested in the topic, uh, but that was, that was good. And all of our materials, thanks to Desiree Fire, were on the website a week after the symposium. Um, and this 650 view um, number is about a month old, so I'm sure we had more. So the materials are still still there if you uh, would like to uh, see them. Next slide. Um, the yeah, the speakers I think were really amazing, um, and uh, and folks had a good time. So I had to include this slide. Next slide. So at right at the conference. Uh, Jeff Plan and I went to the Odyssey uh, conference um, in New, New uh, Brunswick, um, in which was was really really well attended. That's an amazing community uh, of individuals, um, and we were able to present the I two D two on OMOP at the conference. You know, observations. You know, there's they're they're big. I don't have to tell people that. Um, very very active open source community. Um, their their UI, the Atlas UI, is is extremely powerful, but from, from what I could see and what I've heard is that it, it's harder to use. It takes uh, more effort to, to learn it and use it. It's a power user tool. Um, I think having the I2B2 UI as, as part of their you know, sort of offering um, could be a major benefit to sites that wanna offer a, a query tool for a, um, the, the, the less power user. Um, and also we have several enact sites out there that use I2B that have maintained both I2B2 and OMOP databases. And so once we get this I2B2 and OMOP out um, into the community, it, it might make it easier for them to not um, need to maintain both databases. So anyway, that was that was kind of neat. Uh, next slide. This is my last slide. So we we just finished uh, the AMIA conference in New Orleans. Um, that was that was the, the the largest. I think they had like 2,400 uh, people attending that um, largest AMIA ever. Um, a lot of talk, obviously, about uh, AI and large language models, ChatGPT. Um, very interesting um, session. Um, the next AMIA will be in. March in Boston. So we're talking about should we should we as a, an I2B2 community do something, you know, either a, a hands-on workshop or a hackathon or something before or after it. So we're we're talking about that. And we also want to announce that we have decided to hold our um, symposium next year in June instead of September. Um, there was a lot of requests. Uh, September is kind of a, a packed month for conferences and people are kind of we're a little burnt out, so they they like the June um, date, so June 24th and 25th. If you'd like to be part of the planning for that, please let me know. Um, and you know, uh, it, it, so we got to we got to start the planning right right after um, the first of the year. So so please jump in and uh, raise your hand if you'd like if you have ideas or if you actually want to be part of the planning. So next slide, I think that's it for me. Oh, 
I'm not going to say a lot about this, um, but we have a new release coming out um, literally next month that will include the new user interface and also I2B2 on OMOP. And then another version coming out in April that will have some additional features that uh, very much focused on um, providing support for the uh, Enact network. So if you want that new UI, you're, you're, you're going to get that as a the holiday part, holiday uh, present at the end of the year or, um, or the April release um, as well. So I will stop here and turn it over to Jeff. Okay, Let's see, where, where's my, <laughs> I suppose I'm kind of looking at my camera, I'm in a different position. Um, this is uh, one of the features that is going to be in the April release of I2B2. So, I talked about this recently at AMIA, and so it's focused on a scientific study we just published, um, but I'm also going to talk about how it's going to be part of I2B2. So this was the, this paper. Um, I'm sure the slides will be available and you can um, grab it if you're interested in reading it. Uh, it. Also, the code is all available on our GitHub and you can download it. We'll eventually have a version of the code, of course, incorporated into the I2B2 GitHub, but not maybe until April. Uh, so the the point of this is we're interested in finding ways to utilize data in I2B2 instances better. And there is a lot of uh, incomplete data in all of our I2B2s. And it's not because we're bad at writing ETL scripts. It's because of many other factors. And one of those factors is that patients don't necessarily get all of their care at a single healthcare system. And the result of that is you think you're doing research and you have a patient cohort that all has the disease you're interested in, but some of the people have rheumatoid arthritis and you might not have any record of that um, if they're getting all of their care for that condition at a different healthcare institution. Uh, so those kinds of false negatives where you uh, don't know important information can really bias results and underestimate the disease prevalence and treatment effects. So this is just a little animation that shows that this person maybe gets different kinds of care, uh, like obstetrics or primary care or specialty care in different healthcare systems. Um, and, and then there are the people who only touch the healthcare system when they're in accidents. And uh, th those patients, don't have very complete data, but for a different reason, we actually have all of their data, just not data that's particularly usable. So focusing on the, the first case more, we uh, developed this tool that was, uh, I think the term was coined about 15 or 20 years ago, loyalty cohort. Um, Josh Lynn, um, Harvard investigator, came up with uh, a particular method of calculating a loyalty cohort, which he validated a few years ago. And we started with that as our uh, as our starting point for this project. So a, lot, a loyalty cohort, it's intended to find patients where you think you probably know everything about them. Now, because obviously you don't know what you don't know. So you can look at utilization of the healthcare system. You can look at where they live in relationship to the healthcare system. You can with some reliability, figure out if they're getting their primary care at the healthcare system, which increases the likelihood that they'll be getting more all of their care at the healthcare system, and at least increases the likelihood you have some record of what is going on with the patient, maybe an accurate problem list at least. So this uh, validated regression model that was published has 20 proxy variables to predict completeness. And those proxy variables focus on healthcare utilization and um, preventative care measures. I think preventative care trying to capture the uh, primary care aspect of it. Um, so we took this 20 proxy variables regression equation and we created a tool that runs on I2B2. And we ran it on um, at three of our ENACT sites that have large I2B2 instances. and um, and so we have this tool that actually is in our GitHub and you can download now and you can use the, the idea behind it is that it'll give you better cohorts. These are the, these are the 20 variables that were published. Um, a lot of utilization measures on the left, like one or two diagnosis codes, some number of medications, visits with the same provider, 
Uh, and then the uh, routine care facts, which are the ones in bold, which uh, are like medical examinations and specific things like flu vaccines and A1Cs and mammograms and pap smears. Um, and so the first the first trick was to map this all to the enact ontology, uh, which which we, we were used for this obviously because we had enact sites. It, it should be pretty translatable to other ontologies, but of course those twenty variables um, turn into a lot of folders and leaves in the ontology, and so we have four hundred eighteen codes that these twenty variables turned into, um, and then and then we built this. Uh, the SQL script that runs in the database and calculates these loyalty cohort scores. And these are, are effectively derived facts that can be put back into I2B2. So pay, you take your cohort, of, you take all the patients, your cohort being the entire data warehouse, and you compute the loyalty score. So they get some contribution of, of a loyalty score from each of the 20 things based on the regression equation coefficients and they get a score and above some certain score threshold a cutoff of your choosing you get a cohort of patients that have presumably more complete data so we did this um, we choose a date range that avoided covid uh, we only looked at patients over 18 because there's a uh, it, it, most of the <laughs> metrics in there are really only relevant to patients who are adults. Um, and we found that computing the loyalty score over a two year period was a pretty good, it, that was the minimum look back that gave us good results. Because uh, if you look back over one year, I mean, you're not gonna necessarily have a checkup every year and you're not gonna get all these routine care things every year. But over a two year period, you probably are gonna get most of them. And, uh, and it, it, we found um, pragmatically that it gave us good results at all of our sites. Um, the way we evaluated this, because we don't know what we don't know, we didn't have claims data to connect it to, is we just looked at patients that we decided were loyal. Do they come back to the healthcare system the next year? Which is kind of a low bar, but at least you know if they didn't come back to the healthcare system, they're probably not loyal. And so you're at least at least you have a very, uh, very was that very specific metric. metric. So, um, so we did we did our evaluation on that, and then we used that same idea of did they return to the healthcare system in the following year to retrain the regression model at each local site to see if this general regression model that was trained at a particular site uh, is transferable first of all, but also does retraining it make a uh, make a difference in, in performance of the score. Um, so we did this at MGB, at University of Pittsburgh, and University of Kentucky. Um, so we got we got these uh, these AUCs on our ROC curve. We got uh, 0.77 on average at each site and then after retraining 0.81. So you wouldn't want to use this metric with a 0.77 AUC to decide if you're going to perform a high-risk cancer surgery on a patient. But in terms of selecting an enriched cohort that probably has more complete data, it's really pretty good. And I'm surprised that the, the change in AUC, at least, uh, didn't shift that much when we retrained it on the local site, though you'll see in some of the later slides that the retraining actually is, is important. It captures a different subgroup of patients, depending on local practice patterns and coding practices. Um, it reduced the cohort size by about half. So it's about throwing out about half the half the patients in the cohort that don't have complete data. And that varied by site because uh, like some sites had um, a lot of patient, we, we only, our, our cohort was patients with at least one visit, but there were a lot of patients with just one visit at some sites and less so at others. Uh, it depended on whether patients were coming just for um, a, a, a single one-time thing or whether they were actually receiving care. Uh, yeah, and we, and we got good uh, specificity. And the specificity here is the specificity that the patient was able to return to the healthcare system. So that's good 
good to have high specificity. The sensitivity is less important because the metric we chose is not a perfect metric of loyalty. So getting all of those people might not be important, or at least that's how I justified it to myself. Um, so we also wanted to really be sure that we're not just computing a different way of figuring out the Charleston score. Charleston comorbidity index tells you how kind of how sick the patient is by giving a score for the number of comorbidities they have. Um, so you don't want to just give a high loyalty score to the very sick patients. You also want to capture the loyal patients who are not as sick and therefore coming to the healthcare system maybe once a year, but not all the time. And we, a bit of a confusing graph, but you can see on the left that the correlation coefficients were low. There was low correlation. Uh, the graph is the decile of loyalties on the, on the y-axis and the comorbidity index is on the x-axis. So that means that the, uh, for all levels of loyalty, we had a similar, though not the same, distribution of comorbidities. So even the least loyal patients could be very sick and the most loyal patients could be healthy, which is what we were looking for. Um, so th this is a, another view. This is the coefficients in the regression equation. It's the square root of the odds ratio on average at the three sites. In the next slide, I have it site by site. And um, the blue dots are the original reg regression equation. The red dots are what they looked like after retraining on local sites. So it, it does shift. The, the magnitudes shifted a little bit, and that, that's not as important. But sometimes the, the direction shifted, like ED visit um, moved from being a positive predictor to a negative predictor of loyalty. And that's probably because at the sites that we were including, an ED visit probably means that you ended up there but don't receive healthcare there. And it was, it was a tertiary care hospital that could handle the problem. And you're probably not going back there anytime soon. So that kind of retraining turned out to be important to capture like specific types of patients. And you can see that there was some variance um, variance from site to site, um, which I'll leave this up for a minute just because I think it's it's kind of interesting to lose yourself in. Uh, but I think it's interesting that uh, one site uh, having a couple of routine care facts like really increased the chance that they were loyal, but at other sites, it was slightly negative. So maybe getting your primary care there meant you weren't getting any other care. I'm not entirely sure how that happened. And so at each of these, we could we could spend some time digging into. Um, we we're also interested in uh, bias because that's, that's an important thing to think about. Um, and we wanted to see if the demographics of the full cohort were the same as the loyalty cohort. And all we have are the, the demographics in our I2B2s. So we don't have like their insurance information or their income level or anything like that. But we were able to look at the basic like I2B2 demographics. And we found that the loyalty cohorts were all slightly more female, slightly older, and mildly sicker. And um, but it was mild. So if you think about it, that makes sense because who is that mostly excluding? Well, it's definitely excluding young males who are known in the literature to not really touch the healthcare system unless they get really, really sick. Um, so it actually is the change in demographics that uh, one would expect in a loyalty cohort, which, which highlights that this method is picking a different cohort than everybody in the hospital and necessarily so because patients that utilize that healthcare system more frequently are maybe a slightly different kind of person. Uh, so that's an important thing to keep in mind if, if the research you're doing would, would be biased by that. Um, so we have this open source implementation of this, which you can download and use if you have the Enact ontology in your I2B2 and give it a try. Um, what we haven't done is we, we've, we've compared it to this metric of return to the hospital. So we know that it basically kind of works, but we haven't, we, we want to use it in a pipeline of computational phenotype, which Griffin will talk about 
in a few slides, the, the phenotyping pipeline, to see if it improves um, the phenotyping algorithms. Um, and again, this will be incorporated into I2B2 uh, early next year. So this was this is the, the the graphic associated with what I just said. We want to uh, we want to use this as the the first step of computational phenotyping, which I will leave Griffin to talk about. Uh, these are my co-authors and other contributors on that study. And um, hey, thanks. That was fun. So I am going to continue running the, the slideshow, Griffin. So just tell me when you want me to go to the next slide. All right, thank you, Diane and Jeff. Um, switching over to talking about computational phenotypes. Uh, a lot of the work that I'm gonna be talking about was developed by Tsangshi Kai, companies Parse Health, Prognosis Data, and many other uh, people. Um, so just uh, noting that I'm the, I'm one giving the talk, but uh, there's, there's a lot of great teams that have contributed to this. All right, next slide, Jeff. We're talking about computational phenotypes because of uh, a problem with the raw EHR data and that the diagnosis codes that are assigned to patients, for example, an ICD-10 code for type 2 diabetes often has low precision in predicting the patient's true condition or phenotype. So for example, the ICD code for type 2 diabetes, it may only be that half of those patients actually have diabetes. And the others were assigned a mistake uh, in the coding, they had type one diabetes or was put for billing purposes or the patient was being evaluated on whether or not they have diabetes but don't necessarily have that diagnosis. So uh, a problem when you just count that everybody with the code has a diagnosis is that, for example, in clinical trials, you can overestimate the number of eligible patients from the EHR data and end up not being able to recruit enough patients. Next slide, please. So computational phenotypes are using algorithms to predict which patients based on the EHR data actually have the disease. I put algorithms in quote here because this means different things to different people. And I'll describe in the next couple of slides uh, what, what that exactly means. So next slide, Jeff. So here's a very simple approach to phenotypes that's been in ITP2 since the begin very beginning. So when you drag over type 2 diabetes to the query tool, you can click the occurs button at the top and say, I'm looking for patients who have more than two occurrences of this code in their chart. So just simply selecting for more than one occurrence. And this increases precision, meaning that more of the patients that match your query are going to truly have the disease. But you end up reducing recall. You're going to accidentally filter out some of the patients who really have disease by, by doing this. Also, by selecting more and more um, occurrences of disease, you could be introducing biases by selecting sicker patients or patients who have more years of data. And it's not obvious exactly what the cutoff should be. You're kind of making a guess of what value to put here without any other information. So this is a really simple approach, but it is a method that allows you to narrow down to patients who actually have the disease. Next slide. They're more complicated rule-based phenotypes and just looking for two occurrences of the same code. So for example, insulin is a medication that's often given to patients with type 2 diabetes and hemoglobin A1C is a laboratory test that's used in these patients for um, determining how well their disease is under control. So you can say, I'm going to look for patients who have all three of these things. And if they have all three of them, it's going to, again, increase the likelihood that they really do have diabetes but you might be losing patients who didn't have one of those other two things. Similarly, you can increase the recall of your cohort by capturing more patients who actually have diabetes by saying, I'm looking for diabetes code or insulin or hemoglobin A1C. And if any one of those come in, you can do it. So there's different ways you can develop rules on this. A challenge is that it leverages clinical knowledge to define the inclusion and exclusion criteria. And this can be difficult. You have to find the clinical expert to come up with the, these rules. And then you have to go through the process of chart review to make sure these are selecting the right patients. It can also overlook the complexities, data quality problems, and biases of EHR data that are unique to each organization. 
So a rule-based phenotype that works in one place may not work at another institution if they, for example, just don't have the same codes as the institution that um, developed the rule-based system. Next slide. These rule-based phenotypes can get fairly complex. Uh, there's a website, FKB, or the Phenotype Knowledge Base, where dozens of phenotypes that have been developed have been posted, a lot of these through the Emerge network. Uh, these complex flow charts shown on the right can be difficult to implement into I2B2, and each one would require custom programming. So this is difficult to scale this out um, beyond uh, you know, a limited number of phenotypes. Next slide. So the kind of computational phenotypes we're talking about now for upcoming release of I2B2 is machine learning based phenotypes. Those are computational phenotypes. These are using artificial intelligence and machine learning models to estimate a probability that a patient has a phenotype by combining many different features about the patient. It's not only the diagnosis, but also medications, laboratory test procedures, or other things that might be relevant. It automatically, the algorithms automatically select those features and assign a higher weight to the things that are more important and less weight to the less important ones. Um, by doing this, there's less dependency on the clinical experts because it's done automatically, and it can be done at scale. We can run the algorithms across thousands of different types of diseases and uh, millions of patients. The results of these algorithms, again, are probabilities, and then you can set whatever threshold you want to be able to fine tune the precision in recall for uh, the application you're developing for. So it's more flexible than something like a rule-based model where the patient either has or doesn't have the disease. Next slide. There's a lot of work that's been done over the past 15 years leading up to the algorithms we're using now in I2B2. So the first one I'll talk about is fee codes. This was a grouping by Josh Denny and others uh, of ICD-9 codes and later ICD-10 codes into disease categories. So for example, the ICD-9 or ICD-10 codes for type 2 diabetes, there's a many individual versions of that. So type 2 diabetes with ketoacidosis, without complications, with unknown complications. So all of these get rolled up into one fee code, 250.2, which means type 2 diabetes. So simply building um, a rule based off of a fee code rather than the individual codes makes your model more robust and um, stable across institutions and the different types of codes different uh, clinicians might use for their patients. Next slide. In 2008, Tang Shikai and others involved with ITB2 developed an algorithm called Phenorm. And what Phenorm does is take the fee codes that a patient has and normalizes them or adjust them based on their uh, relative to their healthcare utilization. So for example, a patient who's had five visits at your institution, if three of those visits were about diabetes, um, that means something different than a patient who's been at your hospital a hundred times and only three of those times there was ever any mention of diabetes. So it's looking at the total amount of fee code that the patient has divided by the amount of visits that they've had at their institution. So by combining the fee code along with healthcare utilization, they see that the, the distribution of those values forms this sort of bimodal distribution where there's one bump that represents the patients that really have the disease and another bump that represents patients that somehow randomly got that code. Either it was misassigned to their chart or um, uh, it was done for billing purposes and not that they really have the disease. And they have an algorithm that tries to separate those two distributions out to find the patients who look like they really do have the disease compared to their utilizations and the ones that don't. Next slide. This phenorm idea of normalizing your amount of, of the code to the utilization was then extended in two algorithms called Kesser and Comap. Kesser, or knowledge extraction by sparse embedding regression, what that does is it takes not only the fee code of the disease and the healthcare utilization, but it tries to find other features in the chart that are related to that fee code. So it'll automatically find about 200 features, an example of diabetes that might be relevant to diabetes and that you should consider in a statistical model of predicting which patient has that phenotype. Um, an advantage of this is that 
rather than asking a diabetes expert, give me 200 features, this will automatically figure that out. It can be done fast. Within a few hours, you can go through hundreds of different phenotypes and get lists for each one of relevant concepts. Kesser does not build a predictive model. It's just giving you sets of codes that co-occur with a high frequency with the concepts you're looking at, which can be used to generate a, uh, a phenotype model afterwards. The algorithms in Kesser are optimized for fee codes, as well as things like Rx norm ingredients, loin biomarkers, procedure codes, and others that can be rolled into these models. The second thing, COMAP, or knowledge-driven online multimodal automated phenotype system, is what takes those variables from Kesser, assigns coefficients on them so they can be turned into an actual predictive model. So this is taking those coefficients, either from Kesser or another source, assigning coefficients and creating the models. It also uses an unsupervised learning algorithm to figure out the cutoff on those models. It says, if you run this model uh, and a score comes out greater than a particular value, those are the patients that are likely the ones that have the disease. So this entire pipeline can be automated with minimal um, uh, domain expert intervention to, to tune it. Next slide. Um, and then the final innovation is what Jeff just spoke about. Um, when there's patients with low utilization, meaning they've only, for example, come to your hospital one or two times, there just isn't enough information to be able to determine with high confidence whether or not they have the disease or not. So uh, an initial step into running the computational phenotype pipeline is to remove these patients with low utilization. There could be very simple ways of doing it, for example, just looking for patients who have three or more visits since, an, uh, since a, a cutoff date like 2010, or leveraging something like the full loyalty cohort algorithm, which uses AI and ML to do this in a more sophisticated way. Next step, uh, next slide, please. So this is what the results of these algorithms look like. So when you apply Kesser feature selection to type two diabetes, you get a couple hundred terms of items that are related to type two diabetes. Some are very obvious, like type one diabetes or some of the medications that are associated with it. Others may not be as obvious as why they're um, linked to it. But um, these are all items that um, should be incorporated into a model you develop. When you plug it into COMAP, some of these things fall out and they end up getting a coefficient of zero where it turned out that it wasn't very useful. Um, but the test will give you a good set of uh, of concepts for initial starting point for your model. Next slide, please. And when you put this into COMAP, on the left, it's assigning weights. Usually the greatest weight is the fee code itself. So of course, if a patient has more type two diabetes in their chart, they're more likely to actually have type two diabetes. The utilization has a negative coefficient. So then the more times they've been to the hospital, the uh, you're decreasing the score there. So you need a lot of type 2 diabetes relative to the number of uh, hospital visits they've had. And then there are a bunch of other concepts with smaller coefficients like metformin, hypertension, insulin pumps, where if those things are included in the patient's chart, it's either evidence for or evidence against that they have that phenotype. So when you plug patients' charts through this model, it looks like the score distribution in the first graph. So some patients have scores all the way down to around negative three, and some might have all the way to positive three. As you can see that those two bumps, um, the algorithm fits two Gaussian distributions. So the blue curve is the patients who probably don't have type two diabetes and the orange ones probably do. And then you can convert those two curves into a probability on the, on the right most graph where you set the threshold. By default, you may just say where it's about a 50% chance they really have diabetes, or you can shift it higher to, to uh, have more precision in your um, cohort that comes out of it. Next slide, please. This graph here is showing when you plot patients on uh, with a code for diabetes on this graph. On the x-axis, it's the log of the number of days where they had that fee code assigned. And on the vertical axis is the number, log of the number of visits that they've had. So the patients fall in this distribution. The red horizontal line, everything below that are filtered out. Those are the patients with low utilization. The vertical green bar is what we've always had in ITB2, where you're picking 
greater than two occurrences, for example, and you'll say all the patients to the right have diabetes and the ones to the left don't. But again, you don't know where to place that green line. You're basically guessing if you're an I2B2 user. The FENORM algorithm from 2018, that's the diagonal purple line where everything to the right of it, FENORM says the patient does have uh, the condition and then everything to the left, it says that the patient doesn't. And then adding in those additional variables through Kessler and COMAP shows that it's able to take certain patients that would have been classified in one way in phenorm and flip them to the other side because there's additional evidence in their chart that says that they either did or didn't have that condition. So just illustrating a bit the evolution of computational phenotypes that we're using and how all these algorithms fit together to get the final classification. And next slide, please. Uh, as I say, you don't need to do a lot of chart review. It's all an unsupervised algorithm, but the final end, you probably it's worthwhile picking out maybe 20 patients who the algorithm says has the condition and then just double checking with chart review to see that they really do. So at um, one of our hospitals, we did this um, and uh, 69 phenotypes were validated with chart review and have been incorporated into the hospital system. So. Um, these all, uh, as kind of predicted by the algorithm, are able to accurately identify the patients within an institution that truly have this condition. Next slide. Um, so some final comments about the implementation of this pipeline. This is now available in GitHub, all the code for both the Kesser and the COMAP algorithms. It's under an open source license, same as I2B2. Um, this, though, is going to be moving out of this repository and integrated into the I2B2 1.8.1 after we've completed the testing and tried this out at a couple institute, more institutions. Um, one thing that's different about this, as well as a loyalty cohort, compared to other ETL work that we've done in the past, is that there's parameters in these machine learning models that might need to be adjusted. The, the Kessler and COMAP algorithms may not converge to an answer. It may not be able to come up with a computational phenotype based on your the data at your institution. And there are tweaks that might need a statistician's help to correct for this. Uh, hopefully it will work in the institutions we've tried it at. It's been successful, but these are complex machine learning models. They're not simple ETL processes. So it's a new way, a bit of thinking about how your data are being loaded and what you have to do to confirm that. Uh, the, the, the ETL and pipeline and supplicant processes were successful. One of the benefits of the Kessler and COMAP algorithms compared to other computational phenotype algorithms is that these algorithms support federated learning across a, a distributed federated network for robust network-wide phenotypes that don't overfit to individual sites. What this means is we'll be able to roll this out to shrine networks like the ANAT network where institutions won't have to share patient level data, we can still do aggregate counts and statistics like we've always done, but we're able to build up the Kessler and COMAP algorithms in a way as if they were pulled together. So we can come up with a network-wide algorithm that won't be over-tuned or overfit to an individual site, but we can continue to do this in a, a federated way. And as, we, as more institutions adopt this code, we'll be able to have a larger and larger cohorts of patients that feed into these algorithms to make them more accurate. And uh, I think that was my last slide. Is that right, Jeff? Can you... Yes. Yeah, I was muted. Though. Sorry. Yeah, it's your last slide. Good. So, Griffin, um... This is rolled out at Mass General Brigham. And I think, are you in the process of rolling it out at BI as well? Yes, we're we're trying to see about, um, you know, I, I, we're, there's IRB amendments we'd want to do to make sure that we could do this, but that's that's a plan to incorporate it there because this, this adds a lot of value um, to our system. Other tools out there that just use the EHR data, as both Jeff showed, there could be a lot of missing data. And as I talked about, the data that are there might be incorrect or not um, pulling out what you're expecting. So the combination of both loyalty cohorts and the computational phenotypes is getting a much ac more accurate picture of what conditions the patients really have. 
So there, there's definitely work to roll this out at an individual hospital um, for sure. But the, um, and uh, Jeff, you, you can jump in as well, uh, both of you guys, but the, um, the, uh, the tools to be able to do this will be included in the 1.8.1 spring release, correct? That's right. All right. So all the enact. Well, actually, any hospital that wants to adopt it can um, can, can start to take a, a serious look at this. But enact for sure. I know they're they're talking about picking up this release. Yeah. This is new. We we've written a lot of documentation for this. Try to help sites through this. But uh, feedback um, from institutions is going to be very helpful um, in their experience, both. Uh, installing these and running these at their institutions, as well as the investigator experience, how they're going to go explaining this to investigators and seeing how they're incorporating this into their research. Yeah, we're only aware of about five sites who've run the loyalty cohort uh, algorithm code. So anyone who wants to try it, uh, please don't wait until the spring release. You can go to the GitHubs that we had links to and give it a try. Feedback is good. Questions for Jeff or Griffin? Right. Any um any interest in in talking to us about the um the um, symposium in June and like putting together a um an agenda that would be uh, enticing. Um, also, we're we're really we're really starting the early conversations. Although June is June is not that far off, <laughs> so we gotta we gotta move on it. But um, talking about doing a, a hackathon that involves uh, you know a large language model, um, kind of kind of a, a, a further carry on from what we did at the last symposium. So I let's see Chris Connor is on the call. And she's on the call. I know that um, Intersystems and Chris were both very involved in the symposium. Any thoughts on that? Nobody wants to volunteer. It's right before Thanksgiving. I don't blame you. Yeah, I've, I've had a, some tryptophan. I'm, I'm starting my tryptophan shots now, so it doesn't bother me too much on Thursday. Um, I was, I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question, Diane? We're just talk, we're talk, we're talking about putting together a like a hackathon at the oh the yeah museum and really planning for that because th those things are not uh, they don't come together <laughs> by themselves so really talking about what that would be and how we would set up the infrastructure and how we would organize that um, I think I need to I think I need to try to pull together a, a group of people a small committee to to start talking about that and organizing that sooner than later and just wanted to know if um you know you'd be interested in uh, yeah yeah, I would love to help. Um, sounds like a great idea. What we certainly saw from the uh, symposium, the AI dem demonstration at the symposium, you know, that uh, system integration is non-trivial. And, uh, you know, being able to kind of set this platform up that we could use, you know, for invite others over would be, um, you know, it's going to take a little bit of, little of time, as, as you were saying. So, yeah, I'd love to help. Great. Yeah, and I know Mike Mendez, we will pull you in as well, for sure. He can mute, but he cannot hide. <laughs> no. Yeah, no, I messaged uh, Diane directly. So privately. He didn't want he didn't want to volunteer in front of the whole group. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't have to. We'll we do rolled. it for him. <laughs> we will, Mike. Any other questions, comments, um, any other, anything at all, even on uh, another topic? We will let folks get back to their 10 minutes left of their lunch break. All right, I think we're, I think we're a wrap. All right, thank you very much for joining. Morning, everyone. Uh, again, um, have a wonderful Thanksgiving, and um, we will see you uh, in a few months.
See you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Th